Welcome to Lecture Zero Logistics for Introduction to Deep Learning for Spring 2022. The outline for today's lecture will start with who should take this course, who should not take this course, learning outcomes and content overview. So that'll talk about the topics that we'll be covering, course logistics, scores, cutoffs, and grades, as well as student and TA expectations. So you have an idea of what you should be doing uh, and right, what's expected of you. Teamwork, study groups, and cheating, as well as challenges that fit into all of these. So starting with who should take this course. So students uh, from any background that want to learn deep learning, this is who the course is designed for. And that's a pretty broad audience and that's intentional. So anyone who wants to learn deep learning, you're in the right place. Uh, students who are willing to put in 20 hours a week on this course, this course is a lot of work. And if I were to put a number on it, I'd say um, you'd want to budget for at least 20 hours a week to put into this course. Uh, it's also for students who give a continuous feedback and engage on Piazza. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, later and students who are mature and want to be challenged, uh, students who want to be ready for AI research and engineering roles. So these are the core types of students that the course is designed for. And to give some examples of successful people, we have architects. So uh, no, not the computer architects, although we do have many of people who are computer architects, but the we've had architects who the people who build buildings, right? Uh, we've also had musicians. So we've had a Grammy Award winner, social scientists. I myself come from an economics background. And we have people from psychology, as well as hostage negotiators. So um, yeah, and uh, these are just some examples of very diverse backgrounds who come to learn deep learning. And they make it through and a lot of them end up being TAs. So uh, there's also the more normative examples of successful people who take this course, right? The software engineers, computer scientists, data scientists, quantitative analysts, anyone who when applying to a job that says you should know machine learning or wants to say they know machine learning just to put on their resume, usually the employers will assume when you say machine learning, you mean deep learning. And they'll ask you questions about deep learning and of the machine learning experience you have, the deep learning experience will stand out the most, at least in the current meta. So there's also, of course, computer vision researchers, natural language researchers, and speech and audio researchers. So uh, people who want to specialize in these, we teach a lot of the prerequisite knowledge specific to deep learning that you need to know to do deep learning research in these fields. So, yeah. And right, just to emphasize that a bit more, we have students from many departments and this is not an exhaustive list. And if you see your name in here, great. That means there were many students before you who were successful in uh, with coming from a similar background. But if your name's not on this list, that's okay. We're um, yeah, we're here to help you from wherever you're from. And yeah, so to give some examples of neural networks, just so to motivate the subject a bit, you might have had uh, Siri if you used Apple. Uh, there's Alexa, Google Home, Cortana. And these are all examples of audio and speech recognition that's done using neural networks together with question answering. So in terms of speech recognition, one of the more interesting papers that came out recently was on unsupervised speech recognition, uh, which means the model is able to learn without being given the labels or without being told what the transcription is, how to transcribe the audio, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. And we've actually designed a homework homework five that's uh, optional if you choose that over the project where you can uh, do unsupervised speech recognition 
And together with BERT, you're able to do question answering using transformer models that are learned on very large data sets. Um, and yeah, so that's a bit on the audio and speech recognition. There's also uh, NVIDIA DLSS or AMD FSR or Fidelity FX Super Resolution. And uh, one of the interesting papers in that is r the real ESR GAN. And we'll give some examples of that here. And you can see it's pretty impressive the results you can get with super resolution and it basically allows people who have would otherwise see lower resolution uh, to apply neural networks to see higher resolution so uh, there's also object detection detectron is comes to mind and you can see it does some pretty cool segmentation, object detection, bounding boxes, and these are all done using neural networks. Other creative work includes, you might have heard of deep fakes or face swapping, and there's also even more artistic like style GAN too, where you can see examples of the AI generating uh, art from its understanding of how to make art and the results are pretty impressive as a AI artist that um, creates images that are unique and not replicated from uh, individual people it's its own art style Okay, and then in terms of preparation for the course, there are required classes, so fundamentals of programming are equivalent. Uh, we will assume you have experience uh, coding, ideally with objects, and have an understanding of classes and what algorithms are. Uh, highly recommended classes are calculus and linear algebra. And nice to have our vector calculus in software engineering. Now we will teach the math you need to know when it comes up, but math can take time to learn depending on the person. And so uh, you'll have to factor in to uh, the amount of work you'll need to put into the course, especially if uh, you haven't taken calculus for a while, or maybe your linear algebra course wasn't too intensive. We've had students who they took uh, calculus a while ago and even some students who haven't taken linear algebra and they've made it through the course and um, yeah. So that's a bit on the prep. So who should not take this course? This course is not for students who want an easy A. Uh, if you heard that maybe your friends got an A in the course, that a lot of students who take the course get an A. Uh, those may be true, but anyone who gets an A in Introduction to Deep Learning, it's a certification that they understand the fundamentals of deep learning and they're able to apply themselves to uh, any deep learning problem, or at least understand how to think about the challenges that are in front of them and to find answers. Uh, so if you want a course that will be just easy and you'll just you're guaranteed a uh, this is this course is not for you it's this course is for people who want to learn deep learning and the students who are most passionate about uh, learning the subject uh, the students who put in the time and uh, engage with the instructors to understand where they can improve those are the students that will do well and um, yeah, wanting to learn deep learning, that is why you should take this course. Uh, it's not for students who don't want to work with others. It's a very collaborative environment that we try to foster. And if you don't uh, like discuss with your colleagues on uh, like what types of 
experiments they tried, what worked well, what didn't work well, uh, engaging on Piazza. We try our best to organize study groups and give you opportunity to uh, work with others. But if you don't take advantage of that opportunity, then you'll quickly fall behind. And uh, yeah, which also leads to, right, this is not for students who do not ask for help. So we put in a lot of work into uh, giving you a variety of avenues to get help when you get stuck. Because we want to be efficient with your time. We want you to be successful and no matter what background you're from but uh, if you don't ask for help or if you put off asking for help uh, until days before the deadline when you have the same question that you had the week before uh, you're gonna have a really tough time with this course and uh, some students they learn how to ask for help um, and uh, it might be okay if you're one of those students who genuinely Maybe you don't know how to ask for help, but you want to learn how to ask for help, but you need to try. And if you don't see yourself doing that, learning how to ask for help or just naturally asking for help, then this is not the course for you. This course is also not for students who put off deadlines to the last minute. Uh, we give you about three weeks to do assignments, for example, and in those three weeks, the intention is that you start on the first week, you work on the second week, and then you finish it on the third week. Not that you start everything a few days before the deadline on the third week. Uh, you're going to have a hard time. And by the nature of this work, it takes time for you to train models. It takes time for you to uh, understand those results. Uh, and you need to ask questions about things that you should change, uh, maybe how to reconsider the problem, what might be wrong with your setup, and uh, thinking about how to ask the right question, understanding the answers to those questions, having discussions, those things take time, and you need all the time we're giving you, and that's on purpose. We want to give you time to do your work. Uh, but if you don't take advantage of the time, then you're going to struggle and uh, you, you won't do well in the assignments. So this course is not for students who put off deadlines to the last minute. It's also not for students who want to be given all the answers. So we do teach you how to create your own deep learning framework from scratch. Um, you might have heard of TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, what you make will be very similar to PyTorch, and you'll have a very strong understanding of PyTorch uh, after you do the assignments. And for that, you are implementing equations that we give you, um, algorithms that we give you, because these are core building blocks that do not really change. But in terms of the model training and competing on the homework part two assignments we give base a baseline model for students who need help catching up it's not to give you the a solution uh, we want to help students who are struggling but uh, to get an a on the assignments you need to do your research you need to execute on the methods we teach you. So hyperparameter searches, uh, understanding when there are problems with your model architecture that could be leading to poor training results. Uh, but, and uh, you need to know how to deal with overfitting, underfitting, regularization from a variety of perspectives, from the loss to the data to the parameters. Um, so, yeah, so this course is not for students who want to be given all the answers because in the real world, you're not solving problems that have the answers. If the problem's already solved and has the answer, then the, we the, there's not that much value in you working on it. So uh, we want you to learn how to do things that have not been done before. 
and learn how to think about solving problems that you don't just have the solution handed to you. So you have to find it yourself. Okay. And uh, this next slide, I wish I didn't have to talk about it, but it needs to be said, which is uh, making clear what unacceptable behavior is. So submitting code that's copied from GitHub or other students, uh, there are, and I'm not trying to advertise this, there are a variety of uh, listings on GitHub of student code from previous semesters that do exactly what we're asking you to do. It's like literally the code that answers the questions to the assignment. And you looking at the answers, you copying the answers, you submitting the copied code that's that doesn't show you understand deep learning and that is unacceptable and if you see yourself as the behavior you're doing you could not do what we're asking you to do with the resources we give you um, without copying then you're leaning too much on work that's not yours which is unacceptable and uh, in terms of uh, other students work right you should not be copying code from your peers like literally you copying and pasting code into your assignment you also shouldn't be like looking at their screen while typing your code out that's that's just copying right so what is okay is other students looking at your code to help you debug a problem or if uh, one of your peers is trying to show you how they solved a problem or algorithm but when you sit down to write the code it's you writing the code not by copying um, but by your understanding of deep learning and how to use the resources we give you okay so next is right not engaging or contributing with project groups this course has two offerings there's the course with the project and the course without the project don't take this course without uh, don't take this course with the project if you don't want to do the project and if you want to put off doing the project until the end of the course that's not how this is designed it's similar to the homeworks right where you need to start uh, when we start the projects and uh, it sounds obvious but uh, you need to use the entirety of the time we give you because uh, anytime you put off is time uh, wasted and you won't get back when you start training your model uh, and try to understand the problem these things take time and if you give yourself less time uh, that's one thing but hurting your teammates that's another thing and that is unacceptable and so at the end of the course your teammates will submit an assessment of your uh, ethic and if you did not contribute to the project consistently throughout the course then we will deduct your grade and we've had deductions of 10 percent 20 percent to as much as 50 percent and 100 percent depending on the severity of your uh, lack of consistent contribution and uh, right grades are worth uh, or projects are worth about 25 percent for students doing the project section so you should take the project seriously otherwise it's unacceptable so Okay, there's also, right, disrespecting other students or TAs. We try to make an inclusive environment, and to us what that means is being accessible to wherever you come from, whatever your background is. Uh, we want to be as accessible as possible to students from different perspectives. And just because a student, maybe their strength is in engineering, but their strength is could be they're good at mathematics or they're very creative uh, and likewise the uh, students who do engineering might not have as strong 
uh, of a math background or uh, creative understanding about how to think about problems. And we want all these perspectives to be able to learn uh, deep learning and apply it because uh, we really believe in uh, reaching as many people as possible to teach this invaluable skill. And yeah, so it, if you uh, make fun of students for their background, how they ask questions, if they're in good faith, it you should not be disrespecting them. And the TAs, in addition, we work really hard to help you and we want you to be successful and you, you're not the only people who work uh, very long uh, hours to do well in this course. For us to do well as TAs, that also requires a lot of work. And uh, that's work we're happy to do and willing to do for you because we believe in you and uh, we think that uh, you should be able to learn deep learning. And it for us, it has made our our lives significantly better, and we we want to give back and help you all out too. So disrespecting people is just unacceptable. Um, also, and again, I hate to have to <laughs> to say this; uh, it should go without saying. But uh, if you're complaining or making fun of Professor Bigshaw's disability, then uh, you should not take this class. Um, and uh, he, right, and he's had this from birth, he literally cannot lift his hands above a certain height. So, uh, you know, it's cool. He teaches lecture with a sword, um, but that's, uh, uh, that's because he literally cannot reach high enough to point at what he wants to talk about. And uh, it takes time for him to uh, move around certain places and uh, so your patience and understanding regarding these things is uh, really important because you know we're all just lucky he's still alive so um, it's it's really amazing the um, the amount of work he puts into this course and there's there's no reason to um, say hurtful things about him uh, which students have done and it it, it is hurtful and so just don't take this course if you know if you want a professor who's going to be doing backflips and is young and uh you know that's that's uh professor biksha is great but that's that's not that's not what we do so um yeah and um right so that is worth mentioning and uh yeah just to reiterate right it's neural networks it's a valuable skill uh this is a traditional slide so we'd say this person on the left they didn't know about neural networks you know they might be able to get a job and but uh really if you learn deep learning in neural networks you'll be more like the person on the right who you know it's a very marketable skill and you'll you'll get paid more for it so that's also nice in addition to doing really cool stuff. Okay, so next on the outline, we'll be looking at learning outcomes, content overview. So in terms of learning outcomes, we teach you the engineering behind creating deep learning frameworks from scratch, right? We also teach you the science behind training deep learning models from scratch. We prepare you for deep learning interviews and build projects for your resume. We also teach you the prerequisite knowledge needed for deep learning research. And we teach you practical aspects of what compute resources cost, how to use them efficiently, and the options you have available for different problems. So in terms of uh, topics and content as overview, so the conceptual knowledge starts with some historical perspective, then going into the types of neural networks and underlying ideas. And in doing this, we'll talk about learning in neural networks, training, concepts, practical issues, as well as architectures and applications. 
and we try to maintain a balance between what we call squiggles and concepts. So uh, learning the concepts are more important than these squiggles. Squiggles here being, uh, you know, mathematics, notation. We don't want that to be arbitrarily complex. We want you to understand the notations we give uh, and we try to make them efficient at striking that balance between um, right the accounting versus the conceptual. And there's also the practical knowledge, so familiarity with training, implementing various neural network architectures, implementing state-of-the-art solutions for problems, and just overall we want to set you up for future deep learning research in your area no matter what background you come from. And to go into a bit more detail, the basic neural network formalisms we'll be covering are multi-layer perceptrons, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, Boltzmann, Boltzmann machines, and some more advanced formalisms such as generative models, VAEs, adversarial models, or GANs, and graph neural networks. And the topics we'll touch upon include computer vision, recognizing images, text processing, modeling and generating language, machine translation, so that's sequence to sequence modeling, modeling distributions and generating data, speech recognition, and if we can get to it, some reinforcement learning in games, uh, but a lot of our focus will be on right, the core stuff mentioned earlier, although they do come into play when talking about uh, RL. Okay, so our course philosophy, I mentioned this a bit before, our goal is to teach you deep learning. Uh, and that might sound obvious, but to us what that means is a lot of these arbitrary requirements like deadlines and uh, being able to uh, measure your discipline, these aren't important uh, unless they affect um, our ability to teach you deep learning. And at the end of the day, you're graded on your ability to show you understand deep learning. And we give you many opportunities to demonstrate you understand deep learning. And you'll have multiple opportunities to work towards an A and improve on your shortcomings if you're willing to put in the work. So maybe you didn't do as well on a homework assignment as you would have liked. Maybe quizzes aren't your strong suit, but you're really good at the implementation aspect, or you're at least willing to put in the time to understand how to implement um, what we're asking. Uh, we do have bonuses that will help you catch up and uh, the regular assignments for the Kaggle specifically, if you perform uh, above the uh, A cutoff, you have a chance to get bonus on that as well. So you're rewarded for showing you understand deep learning and that's key. And we talk a bit more about that on the course website and on Piazza when that becomes available. Uh, we also want to tell you when you're wrong, why we think you're wrong, and how you should think about getting the right answer. We don't want to just give you the right answer. We, wanna, we want you to understand uh, how you should be thinking about the problem and how you should go about finding a solution. We don't want to give you the solution. Uh, so um, when we give a starter code or uh, a baseline model, those are to help you, right, just get started, uh, not get you an A just by running uh, the code that we give you. Um, but also for the baseline, for example, that's to help students catch up. That's not to help you know how to uh, get an A. Uh, that you have to do through research and doing hyperparameter searches, 
testing different specifications. And yeah, that's the kind of work you'll need to do if you want to get the most out of this course. Uh, we also don't want you to have just deep learning knowledge. We want you to be able to think critically and creatively about designing solutions to new problems. So this is right. It relates a bit to what I said earlier for the Kaggle competitions, not just giving you the answer, but for the students working on projects, the research that you do, uh, you might not become an expert by the end of this course. In fact, you will not, but you will learn a lot of the prerequisite knowledge that's required about how to think critically and creatively when faced with a new challenge. And there's a lot of new challenges out there and uh, learning how to approach problems is much more helpful than being given the solution to a problem that likely won't be the exact problem you work on when you're in industry or doing research or trying to apply yourself to whatever domain you're from. So keep that in mind. Okay, next is the course logistics. So instructors and TAs, we have two instructors, right? They're Professor Bikshaw and Professor Rita, and they're great, they're experts in their field, and through multiple iterations on this course, have refined it, and uh, they'll be joined with a variety of TAs whose information is on the course page, and we have TAs from Pittsburgh campus, Silicon Valley campus, Kigali campus, Doha campus, so this further emphasizes the fact that uh, not just that CMU is a global campus, but that uh, the students who take our course come from very diverse backgrounds, diverse perspectives, diverse origins. And uh, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, if you want to learn deep learning, we're here to help you. And yeah, for that, we have office hours uh, that uh, their offerings and times are subject to change because of COVID. But uh, right, the office hours are listed on the course page. And yeah. So logistics, the lectures. Uh, so we have in-class lectures, unless the rules change due to COVID, uh, and the lectures are recorded, and these recordings are posted. So it's important that you view the lectures, even if you think you know the topic. Your marks will depend on viewing these lectures, and we will monitor attendance uh, more on this later. But the basic motivation is that from empirical analysis of the data, we find that students who watch the lecture during the week perform the best, followed by students who watch the lecture during when the quiz is given, uh, and the students who perform the worst are the students who they don't watch the lecture, and maybe they just look at the slides to answer questions. And uh, it, it's okay to watch lecture and look at the slides when answering questions because the quiz is, is open book. But uh, if uh, the gap between the students who watched lecture during the week and the students who did not watch the lecture is as much as 10%. And that 10% is a pretty significant gap. So that gap in understanding will spill into your assignments and uh, it will be harder to convey to you why you're wrong and uh, what you need to improve, uh, as well as just 
even before you run into an issue, thinking about the problems you're working on. Uh, so that is the reason that constraint is there. So given the data and uh, yeah, so we'll talk about more about that later. Additional logistics. So reading and engaging on Piazza is mandatory. So if you do not do this, you will fail the class because you won't know uh, the suggestions we give to you on how to think about problems. You won't get the feedback you need when you need help. Uh, and that we put in a lot of effort to give you responses in a timely manner. And um, that takes a lot of work, but we're, we're willing to put in that work for you. And for that reason, uh, if you don't engage on Piazza, basically you're gonna fail the class because, I mean, how are you going to know uh, what you need to do or how you need to think about the problem if you don't read the what we write about those things so uh yeah in terms of compute infrastructure everyone gets three aws coupons each coupon's worth fifty dollars for a total of hundred and fifty dollars so uh i myself i i do use aws but uh, i also have the google colab pro for just for convenience and what i find works best for me is I do my development work on Google Colab. And uh, once I know that my workflow is set up and working correctly, if I need to use additional compute, uh, I'll do that with AWS. And so, yeah, so you must maintain progress to receive a coupon. So we don't want to just give the coupon to students who aren't submitting the homeworks, which are worth a significant amount of your grade. Uh, it, you don't just sign up for this course to get free coupons. That's not how this works. And uh, so we distribute the coupons after we receive them. So um, yeah, they're not just all given to you at once in one lump sum. They're distributed uh, when we receive the coupons. So yeah, keep an eye out for that on Piazza because that's where we'll tell you. Okay, lecture attendance. So um, for this, you'll get marks for attendance. Our performance metrics over the semester show a distinct correlation between attendance and course score. So uh, definitely you need to attend uh, the lecture and like I said before if you watch the lecture versus not watch the lecture the gap can be as much as 10% of a difference in the score you'd otherwise get and because this discrepancy is amplified uh, in your assignments meaning you'll have to do extra work because you're making mistakes that you otherwise would not make if you understood the concept better. And so uh, really the net time you're saving is um, we, we need to be efficient as TAs, helping as many students as we have. And so that is why we have this constraint uh, because we want to be able to help the students who are putting in the work because it is a lot of work and uh, yeah, we want to answer your questions. So there's also an inverse correlation between attendance and the amount of help you require on Piazza and during office hours. So that just further reiterates what I just said and uh, to encourage attendance, we assign one mark for attendance, and that's 1% of your total grade for the course. Uh, if you're in the undergraduate section, uh, it's 1.3%, and that percentage could be the difference between a B and an A, and yeah, so you 
want to take it seriously. Uh, we also track the lecture attendance and so more on that here. Right, so you must either attend the lecture in person or the streamed video with some exceptions uh, and uh, we'll talk a bit more about that on Piazza. So, uh, right, keep an eye out for that. In terms of the lecture schedule, that is on the course website and the schedule for the latter half of the semester is a bit fuzzy for things like guest lecturers because you need to schedule them. Uh, but some uh, examples of lecturers that might be speaking could be Scott, Shinji, Gerald, Graham, um, very great people. And yeah, keep an eye out for that on Piazza. Recitations, we'll have 14 recitations and we'll cover implementation details and basic exercises. Here, it's very important if you want to get the most out of the course that you attend, work through and ask questions on the recitation. And the topics list is on the course schedule on the course website so you can see what the recitations will be covering and it's strongly recommended you attend all the rec recitations even if you think you know everything because uh, you might not know the most efficient way uh, or you might not know maybe how other people think about the problem which when you go into the real world You'll have to work with a variety of people who think of a variety of problems in a variety of different ways. So there's a ton of variables that are hard to uh, constrain. And we help you do that uh, with what we think is most efficient in terms of your time. So definitely watch those. In terms of the recitation schedule, it's every Friday of the semester. And you can see the course page for exact details. Right next is the scores, cutoffs, and grades. So in terms of evaluation, there's four core components to this course that you're graded on. There's a homework part one, a homework part two, the quizzes, and the project. For the part one, you do you create your own deep learning framework from scratch. I mentioned earlier, it's very similar to PyTorch. We call it MyTorch. And when building MyTorch, you'll see how all the core components used to build the vast majority of models that are out there are constructed. And with that knowledge, you'll be able to work in environments that rely very heavily on these frameworks or be a contributor to these frameworks yourself. And so that part is very important, uh, having the engineering knowledge for deep learning. There's also uh, for part two, building competitive models. So we want you to be able to train models from scratch, which is, uh, a very empirical process where you need to understand a variety of aspects of how uh, the model results are reported. You need to understand cross-validation, how to respond to it, hyperparameter searches, um, knowing how to identify when there's problems with your model. And uh, again, we don't, we'll, our goal is not to give you the answer to uh, to give you the competitive model because in the real world, you don't just have the answer. You need to find the answer. And in finding the answer, uh, when others don't know the answer, that is what makes you the most valuable in your uh, application of deep learning and your deep learning research. So 
Uh, yeah, that's part two. For the quizzes, that tests your deep learning understanding uh, and that focuses uh, a bit on the literature if we cite papers for you to review, but it's mostly from lecture. And uh, so you watching lecture, taking the time to ask questions on lecture when you don't understand things, uh, ideally the day the lecture is released, that will help you prepare the most for the quizzes uh, because that will give you time to think about what you uh, what you don't know, what you need to know, uh, and maybe more questions you should be asking that derive from the thinking that you do. Uh, so that's the quizzes. For the projects, we want you to demonstrate your deep learning research ability. And that means taking a problem, formalizing it, learning, okay, what's the data needed to solve this problem? How do I work with it to create a uh, solution that reproduces a baseline we see in the literature or that makes sense for the problem? And how do we improve on that baseline using deep learning to achieve results that maybe have not been seen before uh, and um, there's also reproducing works in deep learning that is a non-trivial task. And so uh, being able to reproduce state-of-the-art papers uh, for the projects, that is one of the ways you can demonstrate your research ability or applying yourself to um, novel problems that don't have answers yet. So no matter what background you're from, whatever creative ideas you have on how you want to apply deep learning, the project's a great opportunity to do that in an environment where uh, you get to work with others, you get to have uh, TA mentors, you uh, get to see what peer review is like, and you'll get feedback that uh, will make you understand uh, where um, your strengths were, where your shortcomings were, and what you need to improve on. And so more on these and the weights for these core components are on the course website. Okay, weekly quizzes. So weekly quizzes, there are 10 multiple choice questions and they're related to topics covered that week on both the slides and in lecture. Uh, sometimes depending on the type of lecture, there might be questions that also involve uh, topics from uh, previous weeks, but um, yeah, so that's what the, like, the quizzes will be on and they're released Friday and close Sunday night. And this may occasionally shift, so uh, don't panic, right? And there will be 14 total quizzes and we'll consider the best 12 of them. And this is expected to account for any circumstance based on inability to work on the quizzes. Uh, so put differently, you could skip up to two quizzes uh, if you have challenges that make it so you're not able to perform as you'd like on them. Right, in terms of the lectures and quizzes, the slides often contain a lot more information than is presented in class. Um, although there is a lot of content covered in class. And so both going through the lecture recording and going through the slides, these are two things that should be done together. Uh, and you should ask questions on either of these things when you get stuck uh, or have trouble understanding something. And Right, the quizzes will contain questions from topics that are in the slides, um, but not presented in class. So uh, 
Of course, there will be questions on the topics covered in class, but uh, that just further emphasizes that you need to be familiar with both the lecture materials and the um, from the recordings and the slides. So there's also topics covered in the recordings that aren't in the slides. So that's just to further emphasize again that you got to be familiar with both. So there will be questions based on uh, latest research papers in the quiz where the links will be provided and that is what it is. Okay, next we'll be looking at the homeworks. So there will be one early homework released before the start of the semester. That's homework zero. And there's four interim homeworks. That's homeworks one through four. So homework zero, it, it, it is a homework, but it's more preparatory material for the course. So uh, it's there to help students who need to catch up. And that's one of the resources we provide. And uh, in addition to the recitation zero parts, homework zero, um, it's a good gauge to see like if you're uh, if a lot of that is new, then you kind of get an idea of some of the extra work you have to put into understanding the um, the assignments. While uh, if a lot of it's familiar to you, then you might do uh, you might complete some of the work faster than average. But yeah, so that that work that's there is there to help you during the semester uh, be uh, closer to the completion time of your peers given that starting basis. So that's homework zero. So homework one through four, that's when we start getting into the actual neural network our, uh, exercises. Uh, each of the homeworks has two parts. The first part is auto graded problems with deterministic solutions. So you must upload your implementation of uh, a variety of classes and functions and objects for the uh, your deep learning framework. And we give the test to tell you if you've implemented those parts correctly. In the write-ups, we'll give you the mathematics that you need to implement the um, functions, the classes, and in the part ones, you'll make, for example, uh, linear layers, convolutional layers, uh, recurrent neural network layers, uh, gated recurrent units. We show you how to do long short term memory. Um, and yeah, so these and a variety of other problems, beam search, those are included in the part ones. In the part twos, those are open problems posted on Kaggle. So um, for homework one, part two, you'll be doing fame, frame level phonetic transcript generation. For homework two, part two, you'll be doing face recognition and face verification. Homework three, part two, you'll be doing um, speech recognition uh, to create sequential phonetic transcripts. You'll understand a bit more of the difference between uh, decoded sequences versus frame level sequences later in the course. Uh, and the final uh, homework four, part two, is what you would traditionally think of as uh, speech recognition transcript generation. So you'll be given the audio 
and you have to create the human readable transcript uh, needed to see what the audio says in text. And yeah, so that's the homework one through four, part one and part two. There are bonus homeworks. A lot of them are autograd uh, for the part ones. For part two, if you get a grade of A and you do better than that, uh, because we release A cutoffs. If you do better than the A cutoffs, um, you can get bonus points and we'll talk more about that later. And uh, these marks will not count towards the uh, final grade, uh, but they make it so uh, you're able to catch up on points if you need them in other areas. So, um, yeah, and just to be extra clear, if you do the bonus, you get bonus points. So if you want a better grade, uh, you should to like if you didn't do as well on the quiz or if you didn't do as well on the homework uh, as you would have liked then you should be doing the bonus okay for our homework part one going into that a bit more so right the part one evaluates your ability to code neural networks on your own from scratch and Right, if you implement all the mandatory bonus questions of part one of all the homeworks, then um, you'll have a toolkit very similar to the auto differentiation library of PyTorch. Um, even without the autograd, you'll still have your own deep learning framework uh, for all the layers you create together with forward and backward, uh, the optimization, the loss, the activations, you'll have all of those components. So you'll learn a bit more about what those mean. Uh, and it's pretty unique, uh, our course, how you're able to create your own deep learning framework from scratch. And uh, yeah, you learn a lot by doing that. So the homeworks are auto graded again and you want to follow the instructions carefully and start the assignment when it's released and then continually work on it uh, through when the assignments do. And so uh, this is one of those things where uh, because part one and part two are released at uh, roughly the same time, you want to get the part one out of the way um, or the part two out of the way uh, so you don't have both of them incomplete by the deadline and do at the same time. Uh, that flexibility we give you is so you can be smart about doing the assignments regardless of what your schedule is. Uh, but if you pu put off the deadlines, then uh, you will have trouble finishing the assignments. So... Uh, yeah, if you fail a test, you get a zero marks for that test. Uh, and if the tests are m meant to be run sequentially, then uh, you should write finish the test that comes before the other in the sequence. Uh, otherwise, even if you pass the later test, uh, it doesn't it might use something from the previous test. So, uh, so you want to, ideally you should do the assignment in order. Uh, slack days, which we'll talk a bit more about later, do not apply to part one. So you have to finish part one by the deadline uh, and let us know if you have any challenges with that. Part two, of every homework test your ability to solve complex problems on real world data sets. So the early submission deadline is required and worth 10 out of the 100 points possible for the homework. The remaining 90 out of 100 points are determined by your final score relative to the cutoff. And the cutoffs are determined after the early submission deadline 
where your score is linearly interpolated between the cutoffs. So, um, yeah, a bit more about that in the last point. So there are four standard cutoffs uh, and they'll give you 90 points, 70 points, 50 points and 30 points um, respectively. Uh, and you could get zero points if you do worse than the fourth cutoff. The fifth cutoff is, uh, so at the upper end, if you do better than the cutoff for 90 points, there is a fifth cutoff that's determined at the end of the assignment. Whoever scores the highest on the assignment, they are the marker for the fifth bonus cutoff. Uh, and right, so grades are linearly interpolated between that bonus cutoff and the A cutoff to determine how bonus points are assigned to the students. So yeah, and uh, it's not possible to get bonus if you're submitting the assignment late. So bonus is only available if you submit on time. So, uh, and that's right because it wouldn't be fair to other students if you submitted late and got a better score and then that would change their bonus score. So yeah, that's how it's set up. Okay, so homework deadlines. There's multiple deadlines and there's separate deadlines for the auto-graded deterministic component as well as the Kaggle component itself has multiple deadlines. So for Kaggle, there's the early submission deadline worth 10% of part two, and it affirms that you've started the assignment and have worked through the starter code we've given you, listened to the uh, Piazza feedback we've given. And so, yeah, that's the early submission deadline. The on-time submission deadline that's your final submission. That's when your final submission is due and it must occur before this deadline to become eligible for full marks. And uh, that's also right the deadline for the bonus. From there, there's the late and slack deadline. So, uh, submissions after the on-time submission deadline uh, will receive a penalty and uh, but you can use your slack days to avoid the penalty but you become ineligible for the bonus and we talk about that uh, we talk a bit about that uh, in this next section here so homework so late policy so everyone gets up to seven total slack days and that can only be only be used on part two, not on part one. And you can distribute them as you want across the homeworks. Um, depending on the course schedule, right? It may or may not be possible for you to use your, uh, your slack days on homework for part two, depending on how close that homework is to the final uh, when the class ends so it's you can't use the slack after the end of the class so uh, for logistical reasons okay uh, right there will be no more submissions after the um, drop dead deadline or the late slack deadline um, but uh, right we're in a time of covid and um, if for any reason you think that there was something that you should have done differently or that you uh, was outside of your control that uh, you think we should consider, uh, then you should reach out and let us know because, right, we try to be as accommodating as possible. Uh, but that only can happen through communication. So please communicate uh, if you have challenges that you would want us to factor into write your deadlines. 
Okay, so for Kaggle, the Kaggle leaderboards, they stop showing up on the full submission deadline, but will continue to privately su uh, accept submissions until the drop dead deadline uh, or the late Slack deadline. So you'll wanna see that course website for the complete set of updated policies. Okay, for the course project, if you're taking 11785 or 18786, then you will be required to do a course project. 11685 students will be assigned a fifth homework uh, that is equivalent to a project. The projects are done by teams of students and the ideal team size is four. Uh, we don't allow teams to be greater than four because historically they, they, they do worse than even the teams with less than four, so on average. So we don't allow that. And it's harder to uh, understand from a grading perspective if you understand deep learning when there's more than four people on the team. So 11,685 teams, uh, those are ideally two-person teams. Uh, it could be done solo, but two people is what the homework, the fifth homework is designed for. And you're encouraged to form your teams early. The projects are intended to exercise your ability to comprehend and implement ideas beyond those covered in the homework. So the project can range from implementing and evaluating cutting edge ideas from recent papers, uh, researchy problems that might lead to publication if completed well, and you can propose new models, learning algorithms, techniques with proper evaluation. And uh, the key to the projects is you're graded both by your TAs and by your peers, and you wanna demonstrate that you understand deep learning. And you don't wanna pick a project that you think, oh, this is an easy project because um, really it needs to be sufficiently challenging so that you're able to demonstrate your full understanding of deep learning. Uh, but you don't want it to be too challenging where um, really problems that are too challenging come down to problems that require way too much compute. And so you should look at the compute resources required to solve your problem. And uh, if it's in the thousands of dollars, obviously uh, you will have to reframe the problem or consider alternatives that do not have as expensive of a setup because that will not just are expensive setups costly, but they take a lot of time to um, do. And uh, the people who use thousands of dollars to make their models, they make mistakes less often and are less likely to waste the money. Uh, whereas students, uh, we try to make it so you, um, right, so that you are not going to make expensive mistakes, but if you do, it's it's okay given the, you know, the tens of dollars we're talking about. But when you go way beyond that, then, uh, right, that's just something to think about that students sometimes don't think about. So more on the course project. So you want to think about forming your project teams as soon as possible. And there's more details on the website on the exact deadlines. Uh, if you don't form your teams, we'll assign you to one. But really, students who do the best are the students who find projects that they have mutual interest in and um, yeah, just uh, being passive about the team assignments, uh, we don't really recommend, but we will assign you if you aren't able to find a team. Uh, each team must, right, submit a project proposal by the date listed on the website. 
Uh, you must submit a midway report about three quarters of the way through the semester. You'll submit a preliminary report three days before the presentation due dates. And you'll make a five minute video presentation of the project at the end of the semester. And this can be presented by one, some, or all the team members, but uh, it will be evaluated by the instructor, the TAs, uh, your classmates, and uh, it's to ensure you explain the problem, right? That you've proposed a solution and you evaluate it clearly and you want to allocate enough time to make the presentation because uh, it is worth quite a bit of points and you want that to be uh, in my experience I've seen students who have great results but very poor presentation uh, and they don't do as well as the students who have very poor results but really good presentation so uh, you'll recall the purpose of this is to show that you understand deep learning and uh, if you're not able to explain your results or articulate them efficiently, then it doesn't come across that you understand deep learning, so you want to take it seriously. Uh, each team will be assigned a mentor from among the TAs who will monitor your progress and assist you uh, if possible. And more details on the project evaluations will be posted towards the end of the semester, and the project is often uh, one of the most fun parts of the course, so uh, students who do the project versus not do the project, um, they tend to like the course more. The students who don't do the project, uh, the course, it's, uh, it does teach the fundamentals, but doing the project really gives you uh, a lot of that research perspective that you need to add a project to your resume that's specific to whatever you want you you choose the project that you're interested in and uh, has you work with a team and deliver on that objective so that's of course project grading right so there's the weekly quizzes that's out of 24 points the assignments that's the homework so part one and part two that's worth 50 points. So each of the assignments is 12.5 uh, points. And then there's the project, um, the team project. So again, it's not for the undergraduates. So you'll be graded uh, out of the, right, the 50 plus 24 plus the uh, additional points that are uh, on the course website for things like uh, attendance. Uh, so for the team project, there's the midterm report, the project presentation, uh, the full report, and uh, yeah, so you'll have to engage in all of these things. And if you don't do parts of the uh, team project, you could receive a penalty. So try to stay on top of that. So student and TA expectations. Okay, so understanding the roles of the TAs versus the students gives you a perspective on kind of what's involved in this course. And uh, so we don't just give office hours and answer questions on Piazza. There's a lot of additional work that we have to do to um, right, make the course possible. And so we, like you as students working really hard, we ourselves work really hard to uh, be as accessible as possible to as many uh, students as we can reach from whatever background you come from. So uh, for the TAs, our roles for homework part one uh, involve things like creating architecture diagrams with examples, uh, solutions created and verified against PyTorch uh, that are used to create the tests you see on Autolab. Uh, we write the mathematics consistent with the solutions. 
that were verified against PyTorch. And we create the write-ups with diagrams, math, and we redact the code so that you kind of have a skeleton of what you need to get started. Uh, and we, right, we verify that all the TAs are able to reproduce the solution and we create the auto lab with the different tests and then we finalize the assignment and answer your questions. So that's part one from the TA perspective. From the student perspective, you need to read the write-up to understand what's expected. You need to work through the examples in the write-up by hand. Uh, you need to write the code to reproduce the same examples. Uh, and you need to consider what changes are needed for arbitrary examples. And uh, you should meet regularly with your study groups to discuss challenges and ask questions on Piazza if you get stuck at any of the stages. For TAs, for part two, our role is to obtain, prepare, partition, and upload the data needed for the assignment with the labels. And we create standard data set uh, class diagrams uh, with example data uh, to help us understand uh, what is involved in creating a lot of these sources because they uh, we make derivatives of data that's available online to meet our course objectives. And uh, yeah, so that takes some accounting. And we identify, train, and validate good model architectures. We keep those private. But we also create efficient architectures and train those and try to log them in a way that you're able to reproduce those if you need to catch up. So model suggestions we give to you are to help you catch up. They're not to give you answers to achieve a specific grade threshold. They're there for students who are struggling and are behind uh, and need help catching up. So that's what um, model suggestions are for because all the information you need to do well on the assignment is in the literature and in following the methods we have recommended to you uh, and have taught you. So you'll want to follow the recitations, uh, right? And yeah, so we also verify the other TAs get the same solution and we verify the efficient solutions too. So. Uh, different TAs are chiefly responsible for different homeworks, uh, but all the TAs are expected to test the homeworks. Uh, and uh, we finalize the assignments and answer your questions. So that's what our job is. So your job is to right, read the write-up that we wrote, understand what's expected from the assignment, uh, then to watch and work through the recitation starter code to identify, implement, um, right, identify and implement models in the literature that perform well, to perform ablation studies of different training specifications, to meet regularly with your study groups to discuss challenges, and similarly to part one, you want to ask questions on Piazza if you get stuck at any stage. So, Getting the most out of Piazza, you should engage on Piazza regularly. If you're stuck on a problem for more than 20 minutes, then you should probably post on Piazza to get feedback to help you get unstuck. So you want to continually make progress and uh, yeah, we're here to help if you get stuck. Uh, if you don't get the response you want on Piazza, nine times out of ten, it's for one of these four reasons. Uh, maybe you did not explain what you tried and the problem's missing context. So if you tried a variety of things that led you to determine, okay, I'm stuck at this point, uh, and you don't tell us what you tried, uh, 
by the nature of how these experiments work and how debugging these frameworks works, uh, we might ask you to do stuff that you already did. So uh, you should tell us what you've done so you can more efficiently uh, know, okay, what is it that I need to do that I haven't done already to work towards a solution? So that's one reason. The other is if you're unclear about how what you observed is different from what you expect. So the reason you want to make this clear is there could be a bug in your code or you could have implemented the code exactly as you understand it. And it's unclear if your problem is because you don't understand what's going on correctly or if you're having trouble going from your understanding to the code and uh, making clear uh, how what you observe is different than what you expect. Uh, that makes it so we're able to tell you, okay, here's how you need to think about the problem conceptually or here's where you might be having trouble uh, in the code. So yeah, so the third is Right, if you did not provide enough information to reproduce the problem, it it it's hard to help you if we don't know how you got your problem, right? Because a lot of by the nature of this work, a lot of the things you do depend on other things you do, and so uh, it most of the time it's not possible to give you your answer if you provide incomplete information. Uh, we'll tell you if you're missing something, but that's just time for that's time you have waiting uh, for uh, being told you need to give more information. So and that takes time for us to right think about okay, why is the problem you're posing not clearly answerable? So it's just more efficient for everybody if you give the complete information. Uh, and yeah, so you also, if you don't watch the lecture, if you don't watch the recitation, if you don't read the handout, if you don't read the instructor post relevant to your problem uh, for understanding and doing the setup, then, uh, Right, you're you'd be asking questions on things that have more likely than not been answered, and uh, the questions that you should be asking if you've done these things would either be clarifying questions on the materials, uh, or they'd be debugging, or they'd be conceptual, but. The purpose of the piazza is not to teach you the concepts from scratch. That's what the purpose of the materials is. And uh, that writing is much more thought out, thorough um, than an ad hoc post we could make on piazza. So you should use those resources to do the assignment as intended. So, yeah. Okay, so next is teamwork, study groups, and what is cheating? So the course deliverables, this course is implementation heavy. Uh, so a lot of coding and experimenting needs to be done and we'll be working with large data sets. The language of, language of choice is Python and the toolkit of choice is PyTorch. You can use other languages or toolkits, but uh, we are most familiar with Python and PyTorch uh, and right there's uh, some support for TensorFlow that you can find online but um, yeah if you want help using the framework we only give help on PyTorch because that's what we're we're trained in so yeah we also Hope you've gone through the recitation zero, homework zero. Uh, so those don't have marks, but they're there so that you're able to show 
that you understand a lot of the base knowledge needed and to help you catch up. Uh, and if you don't have the prerequisites uh, that are required or recommended and you don't want to do the homework zero, then you should probably not take this course because that's there to help get you up to speed. Uh, and it doesn't do that 100%, but it's it's a concerted effort to help you out. And right, if you're not willing to put in the work to get caught up, then you're going to struggle and not do well on the, uh, the assignments, which leads to teamwork, right? So learning happens best together, and you'll learn more from each other than you'll learn for us, from us. And we, we do do our best to uh, teach you and be there to support you. Um, but we're not a substitute for collaborating and doing um, like hackathons to understand assignments, to be working right next to someone and getting feedback on, oh, I just faced this bug. Did you face this challenge? Oh, if you think about it this way, let's go through the problem on the whiteboard. Okay, going through the variables. This is what each of the variables means. These are what the shapes are. Okay, going through the um, the example problems. Are we able to go through the math by hand? Uh, teams, going through that in the study group is a very rewarding experience. And uh, I could say... I would not have done as well in this course if I did not have a, um, a study group when I started. Uh, and for me, my study group, we met four times a week for three to four hours each meeting. And uh, we had things we expected of each other to do in between, like going through the lecture recordings. And yeah, so things like that are really helpful. And whenever we face a barrier, asking the question on uh, Piazza, it's nice to have, you know, the feedback and advice of someone who's really thought about it uh, or who's done the course before, but getting thinking about the problem from other students who are also learning it from scratch that gives you a more realistic experience to what you'll face in the real world which is where you'll be working with other people who are also working towards a solution that has not been created yet and those are the uh, experiences that you'll learn that will give you the most value study groups so um Right, please form study groups. Uh, if you do not have a study group of your own, uh, we'll help form one for you. Uh, but similarly to the project comment earlier, really you'll get the most out of the group if you identify people who share similar habits as you, who are on the same time zone, who are able to meet up at uh, however many times you think is needed given your background. And so everyone needs to be part of a study group. And if you do this course alone, you're not going to do well. So that's, it's really important. Uh, what the study groups do, uh, really that depends on your needs, but uh, it goes over all the assignment materials, which are the homework problems, homework solutions, discussing papers, classwork, quizzes, um, yeah, you're, you're not allowed to copy code, right? I talked a bit about this earlier, um, but you're, you can have students look at the code you did and comment on what needs improvement, uh, or you could look at how other students did the code, uh, but you can't look at th their code while typing on your computer. That's not how this works. So, uh, if it, looks and feels like you're literally copying their work uh, then you probably are so uh, please don't do that uh, but yeah in the study groups 
like I said, it's okay to look at each other's code, to share share your code on the whiteboard, uh, not to send your code to each other in files, but going through um, what you've done or what you need help with, that is that is okay. And we encourage you to meet regularly to discuss uh, deep learning work. Like I said, the group I was in, we met four times a week, uh, three to four hours each session. And often we'd go over if we faced a particularly challenging concept, which was pretty often. And so, yeah, the study groups may go on to form project teams. Usually that's the most efficient because when you meet, then you also go over, you know, you have reminders on other stuff that you should be doing. For me, what I found was nice was having specific days of the week dedicated to specific parts of the course. So uh, maybe uh, Friday was uh, lecture day where, or maybe Tuesday and Thursday were lecture day, uh, where we would meet to discuss lecture. Uh, whereas on Saturday, that might be homework day, and Sunday might be project day, uh, or going over from homework day to discuss what was worked on during the week, and right, just create a collaborative environment to work on challenging problems. So, um, yeah, so in terms of cheating, what not to do, uh, I talked about this, I talked a bit about this already, um, but for the quizzes in particular, uh, each student needs to solve the quizzes by themselves. So, you can discuss the questions with your study groups uh, and friends, but uh, when you solve the quiz, you need to isolate yourself and do it alone. And it's not to be done where, um, you know, you can go through uh, problems and think about what they mean in the study group context, but you can't answer the questions all at the same time uh, that is different than going through and understanding the problems so that you're able to answer the questions and right we're able to track IPs and see when students are submitting and we can use a variety of machine learning methods to tell right who is working on the quiz at the same time and really you should be you don't want to be caught for cheating because we try to make it as collaborative as possible and it's not worth cheating when it really doesn't help you um, knowing what you don't know will save you much more time on the homeworks and if you don't do well on a quiz, we give you a lot of bonus opportunities and you'll do better on those bonuses, better on the homeworks, such that if you don't do well on the quiz, um, I mean, it helps to do well on the quiz, but it doesn't help to cheat on the quiz. So please do not cheat because you will be in trouble. Uh, and right, the homeworks, they need to be solved uh, by yourself in that the code that you write is your code. There's no copy and pasting. There's no looking at the solution while you're typing the, it onto your computer. And yeah, plagiarizing from the internet, uh, like copying and pasting uh, work, that's just not okay. Uh, looking at if someone gives you an equation and you implement the equation, there there's no copying of equations from our perspective for the coding portions. Uh, if you're able to take an equation that's given to you or that you find on the internet and implement it in code, 
and have that code pass the test. That is, it does what uh, you intended it to do and what we tell you you need to deliver on, then that's okay. Uh, implementing math or copying math equations um, that are not in code form and then converting it to code form because, um, yeah, that requires you to understand those equations. And, uh, yeah, so that's okay, but copying code is not okay. Right, and uh, we're here to teach you deep learning, and like I said, uh, you shouldn't take this course if you're not here to learn deep learning. And uh, yeah, you're here to learn deep learning yourself, not to demonstrate how well your friend or the guy on the internet has learned deep learning. And you're at CMU, which means uh, we're currently ranked number one in the world um, for AI. And we... That's a pretty high bar. And so students who graduate from our class and get an A, uh, that's a certification that you understand deep learning, uh, its fundamentals. And if you want to do more work at CMU that is involved with AI and deep learning and research and engineering that involves deep learning, then uh, that's what we're here to help you do. And uh, just the spirit of doing work that does not demonstrate your understanding of deep learning, it will only hurt you in your assignments uh, and you'll do very poorly on other aspects of the course. Uh, and so the net amount of time that you save from cheating is actually not as much as you would think. Uh, and students who cheat end up needing to cheat even more later in the course if they want to uh, make the facade that they're doing well. But uh, you will eventually be caught because, right, the, if you cheat and you keep cheating and if we don't catch you the first time, we will catch you the second time and you don't want to be one of those students um, because we provide a ton of support mechanisms we're very accommodating if you fall behind. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we're here to help you. So don't, um, yeah, don't squander um, what you've, you know, you've come really far to, to make it here and we want to help you get even further. And we can't do that if you want to be a cheater, just don't do it. So yeah, if you're unsure whether something you're doing constitutes cheating or not, you can ask us. And um, yeah, if if you, um, yeah, so you should let us know if you have any confusion. Uh, right, so mentoring. So each group will be assigned a TA mentor to uh, track your progress and uh, reach out to you if you appear to be in trouble. So um, there's a lot of students and so ideally you should make clear, you should communicate your issues because it's hard for us to tell if you're stuck if you don't say you're stuck. But we are a resource for you uh, if you make clear that you're facing challenges uh, and even if you don't make it clear, we do try to maybe identify challenging circumstances that you might uh, miss, like maybe you're um, not keeping up with the assignments at pace we'd recommend. Uh, so yeah, so that is for the TA mentoring. And if you're in trouble, right, you should reach out to your TA mentor and or the instructor yeah, so if you feel like you're falling behind, struggling, uh, if it just feels like too much pressure, we're we're really accommodating and we know students come from a variety of backgrounds, variety of situations. Uh, COVID, it affects students, it affects families, it can make for very hard situations and uh, there are a lot of other things besides COVID that can cause challenges and we're here to um, be as accommodating as possible 
as you face those challenges. So, um, yeah, we try our best to help you. And uh, if you're feeling overwhelmed, then you should watch the uh, recitation on uh, what you should do. Um, yeah, so that's on the course website. And yeah, so we aim to make this a successful course for all of you, no matter what your background is. Uh, we want you to do well. We want you to get an A. Uh, but we want that A to be reflective of an understanding of a standard that is a very high standard for deep learning knowledge and understanding. And if, uh, like I said before, if your goal is to take this class just because you want to get an A, that's not why you should be here. It's because you want to learn deep learning and it's a lot of work to get an A and give you a lot of opportunities to get it. We're here to help you get it, but it is a lot of work. So yeah, and everything about this course is geared towards uh, that objective to uh, let you put in the work and understand the concepts needed to uh, do deep learning and show you understand deep learning. Uh, and okay, so for the outline, next we'll talk about the challenges. So uh, yeah, so this course is not easy. It's a lot of work. And that leads us to the next point, which is that it's a lot of work. Uh, and in case it was not clear, it's a lot of work. And so if you want a class that is easy, like a free A, uh, then yeah, that leads to the next slide, which is this class is a lot of work. Uh, it's not for chickens. So um, this is... Uh, Right, so we're here to teach you deep learning. We think it's a very valuable skill. We have hundreds of students who take this course from so many different departments because they want to learn AI from the number one university in AI on the face of the earth. And, uh, and they wanna get involved in research. They wanna get jobs that are relevant to what they wanna do. Uh, and use AI, and if you want to do AI or understand AI or use it in your work or publish in um, whatever field you're from using AI, then this course, I mean, it's not easy, but then, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be a lot better off for it. And, uh, right, we have students from... We talked about the different types of students that were successful. Uh, there, we are students. They go on to work at top tech companies: Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft. Uh, we've had students publish their uh, projects, make their projects into their thesis, and uh, so there's a lot of value that can be gotten from the course. And so, uh, all the homeworks that you do. Those can be assignments that, when put on your resume, are pretty impressive works. And the Kaggle scores you get are public, so you can share your Kaggle scores. And the deep learning framework you created from scratch, not many people can say they did that. And so um, going through all that to demonstrate your understanding and being able to answer questions on the quizzes that show, okay, I'm in an interview, how am I able to answer a variety of questions that um, could have straightforward answers to, to less straightforward answers? And so, um, yeah, it's been refined over the years to meet the needs of a diverse body of students. And in that spirit, um, yeah, there's, it, it's likely that you'll learn deep learning uh, and we try to make that a certainty uh, if you put in the work and stick with it. 
So yeah, so there's this idea of mastery based evaluation. And so uh, the quizzes, right? We said they talked about your understanding of topics covered in lecture and there's a lot of content in lecture. So doing well in the quizzes is no easy feat. And uh, we do have the quizzes as open book, open note. And so, yeah, you wanna take the time to think through the questions, understand the lecture and ask where you get stuck. And uh, the homeworks for the part ones, you're doing, creating your auto differentiation library from scratch if you're doing an autograd uh, or at the very least creating a deep learning framework from scratch and yeah part two recreating state-of-the-art papers uh, that you find in the literature uh, or whatever is needed to achieve the scores that will help you ascend the leaderboards and that's just reiterating a bit and yeah, so anyone who gets an A in this course is ready for a deep learning internship, ready to start a research assistantship in deep learning. Uh, that is the goal of these standards. And so, yeah, that's, that's basically it. And so for homework zero, recitation zero, please, 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 please go through the videos for recitation and complete homework zero. Even if you think you understand these materials, it's good to go through them just to be like, you know, make sure, yeah, that you do in fact understand them. And it shouldn't be too hard to go through if you think you know everything already. Uh, but if you don't, then uh, it will help give you some perspective. And yeah, so homework one, part one also has many components intended to help you later in the course. So if it seems a bit dense, please bear with it because it's definitely worth it in terms of understanding and being able to do um, well on other components. So. Homework one is the easiest homework. Uh, and I know from, at least from my perspective, uh, homework one was kind of a wake up call as to like, okay, this is the amount of work that's needed for, uh, to do well in this course at a minimum. And it only gets harder from there. So yeah. Um, since I first took the course and it's uh, my sixth or seventh time TAing, uh, we've done a lot of work to, the course started off very, had a lot of engineering complexity in it and we've worked to make it so that the focus is more on understanding and being able to implement the math and concepts and demonstrate your understanding of deep learning concepts than arbitrary engineering um, complexities. So uh, with a lot of this work being implemented from scratch, understanding what good design looks like is important. Uh, and we've refined the uh, what we ask you to do semester after semester after semester to be more and more uh, clean of a design setup. And so uh, in that sense, the course has become not easier, but more accessible to obtaining the deep learning knowledge that you came for, came here for, uh, for to, came to our course for. Uh, if you wanna learn software engineering, um, you can take a software engineering course, uh, and but for us, software engineering is a tool to understand deep learning and uh, the software that's out there. And so, yeah, please do the homework zero, recitation zero, and uh, know that the rest of the homeworks will be a lot of work. And if you have any questions, feel free to let us know on Piazza. Thanks.